Well, hello, uh, welcome back to this uh, third and uh, last uh, video on Murray's Bookchin, Murray's Bookchin's book, um, uh, Social Anarchism or Lifestyle Anarchism. Um, last time we looked at the difference between uh, freedom and autonomy and how uh, the lifestyle anarchist, uh, well, privileges uh, autonomy uh, rather than freedom, uh, which is you know, uh, autonomy is more like the individual um, uh, individual autonomy, just, you know, your own autonomy, whereas, you know, freedom is more concerned with uh, with the collective, you know, it's, uh, it's social freedom. And we've seen that for the social anarchist, the individual autonomy depends on the social uh, freedom of everybody and of the um, and of the collective. And so we uh, stopped last uh, uh, last time with um, with a critique of Hakim Bey's uh, TAZs, uh, the, the the TAZ, uh, the um, the temporary autonomous zones, and uh, and we've seen that um, that at the end um, it is because of individual anarchists of lifestyle anarchists such as Hakim Bey that anarchism has this this bad reputation that it is just all uh, all chaos you know that uh, the lifestyle anarchists they completely rejected uh, order they completely rejected reason which of course goes uh, goes against uh, is um, it is very at, uh, at odds with uh, with what the social anarchist and anarchism in general uh, preaches and advocates so this is what this this third video will be about. It's going to be um, about covering what Bookchin uh, what Bookchin criticizes about lifestyle anarchism uh, anarchism in uh, the sense of you know of their irrationality, their their praise for the irrational, um, as well as uh, their disdain towards civilization and technology. You know, since technology and civilization are uh, products. Of, uh, of of human uh, of human reason and you know the lifestyle anarchist uh, rejects reason all together so that's their main uh, their main target it's reason uh, itself so here Bookchin draws on a particular misinterpret uh, misinterpretation of the famous engraving of uh, Francesco Goya the sleep of uh, the sleep of reason produces monsters which was printed on the cover of fifth estate uh, magazine in the autumn winter of 1993 and fifth uh, fifth estate magazine is an anarchist magazine that was very popular uh, at uh, at that time and what they wrote in that magazine however wasn't that the sleep of reason but the dream of reason uh, produces monster okay the dream of reason produces monsters and this change uh, and this change was significant because goya's engraving uh, meant that when reason goes to sleep when reason is inactive um, that's when you create monsters you know as he himself this is goya uh, goya speaking um, he wrote in his commentary on his his own engraving imagination deserted by reason begets impossible monsters united with reason she is the mother of all arts and the source of their wonders and so the cover of the magazine however uh, suge suggested the opposite that it is the dream of reason uh, to produce monster like it is the goal of reason you know the dream of reason here means its goal or you know when uh, uh, when people, you know, when people dream of reason, that's when people aspire to reason and to rationality, and so that's when they create monsters, you know, so either way, monsters are the product of reason, and it can be, you know, its goal, it can be its dream, or when people dream of reason, well, they are going to produce monsters. So, Fifth Estate is promoting uh, imagination as separate from reason and therefore quote it's a visceral celebration of imagination ecstasy and primality uh, patently uh, patently uh, impones not only rationalistic efficiency but reason as such 
So which now brings us to the next problem of lifestyle anarchist, uh, anarchism following the base uh, TAZ. Lifestyle anarchists came to discard everything that is modern, rational, technological and went for a regressive state of primitive mysticism. Their regression didn't stop at idealism, like we said last time, they went full on to the most irrational actualization of beliefs, uh, even reactualizing pagan uh, rituals and pagan practices. And so Bookshin gives the example of an article from the uh, from, 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 the, from the magazine uh, from summer 1889 uh, uh, and the article is called The Appeal of, uh, of Anarchy which as you can guess the kind of, uh, of anarchism that is represented there is, uh, is everything but appealing. Quote, Thus Fifth uh, Estate's uh, Appeal invites anarchists to cast the magic circle, enter the, uh, the trance of ecstasy, revel in a sorcery which dispels all power. Precisely the magical techniques that shamans in tribal society, not to speak of priests in more uh, developed societies, have used for ages to elevate their status as, hi as uh, hierarchs and against which reason long had to battle to free human mind from its own self-created uh, mystifications. So we find again another contradiction that on the one hand this anarchism is against power, yet it draws on hierarchical social practices, but because these are links to uh, these are linked to, uh, to to magic or to mysticism, well they're taken to be liberating and emancipating. So in fact it was liberating and emancipating not only for the shamans. And the king uh, and the priest, sorry, and uh, who of course uh, would be compared, uh, competing against one another about what practice is more real, more liberating, more mystical than the other. Uh, some would be really, some would be really liberating, while others would be, you know, casted as heresies uh, and um, and you know and uh, and blasphemy and stuff like that. And so. Uh, this immature uh, relationship to paganism, um, I mean, pagan, pa pagan religion, of course, has wisdom and we can draw from it, uh, even use it for political purposes, but it, is not, but it shouldn't be means of escapism, you know, because as soon as the practices are no longer about escapism, then the real trouble begins, you know, like competing for status. So this kind of relationship is immature because, well, it is just dreamy. You know, uh, just by saying that if we make magic, uh, magical circle, circles will dispel power is already one step, uh, is just one step away to see, you know, power like, you know, demons or spirits that one can keep at bay with, you know, uh, talismans or enchanted, uh, enchanted objects, you know, that you can keep away with superstition. Uh, so if power is indeed cosmic, which we saw is kind of the, con uh, the conclusion that Foucault has to draw, um, if power so is cosmic, anything that repel, uh, anything that can repel it, well, is is legit, right? Whatever works for you uh, to make you feel safe from the ghosts and the demons, well, I mean, it's it's uh, it's going to be legit, and so. The problem is this uh, dispelling power with magic circles and incantation, uh, incantations is very different from producing empowering institutions that protect and guarantee the, the freedom from actual power. Quote, dispel all power. Again, there is a touch of Foucault here that, as always, denies the need for establishing uh, distinctly empowered self-managing self institutions against the very real power of capitalist and hierarchical institutions. Indeed, for the actualization of a society in which desire and ecstasy can find genuine fulfillment in a truly libertar uh, libertarian communism. And so a truly libertarian communism would require everything but taking power as superstition. What the, the, the Fifth Estate article is arguing for is a kind of, you know, uh, Rabelaisian utopia. You know, you know François Rabelais, uh, he was a French Renaissance novelist known for his work uh, Gargantua et uh, Pantagruel. And in it there is the abbey, uh, l'abbé of uh, de Telem, in which, you know, students were allowed to do what, whatever they wanted. Right, and so Bookchin tells us that this is the thing that they that the 
lifestyle anarchists have in mind, you know, an abbey of, uh, of Delem. But as he argues, there is one problem. The abbey, uh, he, uh, he wrote, was, rep uh, was replete with servants, cooks, grooms and artisans without whose hard labor the self-indulgent aristocrats uh, of, uh, his, uh, distinctly upper class, uh, of this distinctly upper-class utopia would have starved and huddled naked in the otherwise cold halls of the abbey. And so this means that those who do their voodoo uh, don't have to clean or cook. Uh, they have, you know, servants doing it for them while they go on to enjoy uh, to enjoy their uh, to enjoy their day. And so Bookchin says that this can be avoided if people are libera uh, liberated from work. And he believes that it is possible through a democratization of technology, uh, without denying that some technologies can be inherently uh, destructive and oppressive, uh, or that civilization, you know, has brought only good things. Bookchin highlights that many people have been liberating from work thanks to technology. You know, you can think of slaves, for example, who certainly would be working at the Abbey uh, and the aristocrats would see uh, any attempt at abolishing uh, slavery as heresy because they rely on it so they can lead their leisure, their leisure life. Uh, quote, in the South, plantation owners needed slave hands in great part because the machinery to plant and pick cotton did not exist. Indeed, American tenant farming has disappeared over the past two generations, large, largely because new machinery was introduced to replace the labor of freed black uh, share, uh, sharecroppers. You know, there was no technology after all back then, and when technology showed up, well, slavery tremendously diminished. The racism and inequalities that followed were a matter of politics and property rights, rather, rather than of who owned the technology uh, than, uh, you know, than, uh, um, uh, than, you know, than the technology itself, you know, that, that's kind of, of the problem. Uh, whomever owns it, uh, whomever, whomever owns, uh, owns it is more concerned with, you know, cutting costs and making profit than democratizing technology. And so a rational society, on the other hand, wouldn't use machinery just to reduce labor costs. As Bookchin writes, machines that the bourgeois employ, uh, employs to reduce labor costs could, in a rational society, free human beings from mindless toil for more creative and personally rewarding activities. And so, this is more like the, tradi the traditional view of anarchism, uh, seeing in technology the potential for liberating human beings is, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a true anarchist principle rather than the, you know, the, the lifestyle uh, the lifestyle bullshit because it can guarantee the production of the necessities of life and let human beings be free to occupy themselves with the things that you know can give them meaning the things that they want to to accomplish so to go back to Kropotkin the pro uh, the progress of modern techniques which uh, wonderfully sub uh, simplifies the production of all the necessities of life and so the target of the criticism is therefore any system that that stands in the way of that goal formulated by Kropotkin, and that is capitalism. Quote, the commodity relationship expanded to its full historical proportions that, produ that produced the explosive environmental crisis of modern times. So not in the so not industrial societies, technologies, or, civil, uh, or civilization. Those uh, should be, you know, cherished and uh, rationally approached and planned so that we don't have a few people at the top enjoying leisure while everyone has to produce the essential things in life for their masters, you know, uh, while, you know, uh, there's uh, their liberty, you know, their leisure time of, you know, of, of, of the workers uh, is, not, uh, is not guaranteed. And so a rational society is a society in which everyone has their food, their shelter, their health care, their, their place, their dignity, their relationships, uh, their work and, you know, uh, healthy uh, contact with nature. All of those things should be guaranteed in a rational society so that they can have, you know, the time to live fulfilling lives. 
quote, and we would do well to remember the significance of the rise of modern secularism, scientific knowledge, universalism, reason, and technologies that potentially offer the hope of a rational and uh, emancipatory dispensation of social affairs, indeed for the full realization of desire and ecstasy without the many servants and artisans who uh, pandered to the appetites of their aristocratic betters in Rabelais' Abbey uh, de, de Telem. So, clearly, technology is not the problem. Lifestyle anarchists would say, no, uh, it is the problem because what, cause, uh, what causes slavery in the first place was the irrationalization of the world. And you can't have technology without reason, so again, technology demands rationalization and secularism, and it's precisely what the lifestyle anarchists want to throw away. So, it is just escapism. Uh, as long as the lifestyle anarchist is content, well, who cares, uh, who cares uh, for the rest? Uh, well, if all that it takes to calm the jesting of, you know, a lifestyle anarchist is to sell them a magical necklace uh, and a parchment with, uh, with a spell, well, I think the state and capitalism shouldn't have to worry much. And so this anarchism embodies the value of, you know, the powerful, Actually, you know, the, the lifestyle anarchist is, you know, a bourgeois philosophy. It is, in Bookchin's words, safe, uh, privatistic, hedonistic, and even cozy. Lifestyle anarchism may easily provide the ready verbiage to, uh, to spice up the pedestrian bourgeois lifestyle to, uh, of timid Rabelaisians. The counterculture that once shocked, uh, shocked the, uh, the petty bourgeoisie with its long hair, beards, dress, sexual freedom and art has long since been upstaged by bourgeois uh, entre entrepreneurs who, uh, whose boutiques, caf uh, cafes, clubs and even nudist camps are doing a flourishing business. So in other words, Capitalism and technological de uh, dependency is thriving on lifestyle anarchism. You become more dependent on it because, well, let's face it, uh, left on your own, to your own device, you won't survive one day. You know? So you need the capitalism, you need the state because, well, you cannot rely on yourself. So you need the services that capitalism brings you, uh, you need the state to protect your property, and so hence the hip uh, hypocrisy of lifestyle anarchists. Uh, you know, on the one hand, they are always shitting on technology and civilization, yet they're benefiting. Uh, they're benefiting from it. And so here, uh, Bookchin uh, takes uh, one of uh, Fifth Estate's writers, uh, George Bradford, as an example of theorists who attack civilization and technology, uh, you know, as, as such, you know, like they attack uh, these things uh, as such. And so, uh, and so in his article, uh, Stopping the Industrial Hydra, uh, Bradford seems to argue that technology, it would seem, determines social relations rather than the opposite, a notion that more closely approximates vulgar Marxism than, say, social ecology. And so the meaning is that uh, it is technology itself that is responsible for inequalities and oppression, not the social organization. And so it's like saying that it is the knife that is responsible for the killing, not the murder. Uh, like the knife, you know, would have a will on its own, uh, and you know, uh, and you know, you know, uh, Bradford would probably would probably uh, wrote seals on you know every knife in his uh, in his kitchen. And so, indeed, the lifestyle anarchist, uh, they seem to look at technology in that way, that it is not depending on what we do with it or how we use it. Like, you know, if you have, uh, if you have just a minority of people who own much of the technology and decide what to do with, uh, with it, what to produce, and who gets what from the production, etc. And because they're so powerful, they also decide on where to dump you know, the, the waste, uh, I mean, yeah, you, you're going to have a very different outlook than thinking that technology is doing the wasting on its own, right? You know, if you think that, you know, technology is, uh, is alive on its own and it is doing the waste, well, yeah, I mean, you're going to have a very different outlook, you know? So, in the first example, it is the social relation that determines technology. You know, one person has more power than others, then the powerful will decide uh, which technology to develop, what to create, and who and how it is going to 
uh, we're going to make this this technology uh, work. And so the one without the power, uh, the guy who works on the machines, will have uh, will have will have no say in any of this. You know, the technology will be designed to fit the interests of the powerful when it can. Uh, if you know both people were equal, uh, when it can, you know, if both people were equal, benefit benefit both. And so. Think about, you know, for example, when workers sabotage machinery because they lose their jobs due to it. You know, Bradford's solution would be to just remove technology all together, when in reality the problem isn't uh, isn't the technology, uh, but as Bookchin uh, says, uh, the problem are uh, anchored precisely in social relations of capitalist exploitation, not in technological advances per se. Uh, stated bluntly, downsizing today is not being done by machines, but by uh, a very um, avaricious uh, bourgeois who use the machines to replace labor or exploit it more intensely. And so, Bradford doesn't approve of this because for him there are no social relations prior to technology, but that technology is causing the inequalities in power. Uh, we're then left with the same problem as with autonomy. You know, where is it? Uh, where is it coming from? Quote: By relegating social relations to something less than fundamental, instead of em emphasizing the all-important uh, productive process where technology is used, Bradford imparts to uh, machines and mass techniques a mystic, uh, a mystical autonomy. You know, so if so yeah i mean you if you remove yourself from the social uh, relationships well the uh, the cause for you know inequality and all of that is going to be uh, well technology itself and at that point you're going to have to explain how technology can cause that by attributing to technology some sort of mystical autonomy like if the if the machine is alive and it is causing all of this trouble where well, the solution is simple you know we have in uh, in uh, Bradford's words to begin immediately to dismantle the machine all together this shit is over you're done you're done stand up right now you you stand up stand how dare how you're done stand up and big eager looks at me confused then smiles takes a big sip of vodka spits it in her eyes and goes no one talks to the machine like that. <laughs> Shuts the door in her face, he goes, fuck that bitch, this is Russia. But here the machine doesn't just mean technology anymore, you know, it's not actual machines like computers or assembly lines, lines or cars. Uh, no, he's talking about civilization at this point you know like the machine is civilization if technology is like bradford sees it then it becomes something like cosmic power and it is this technology that is engineering our civilization and you can't have another civilization without technology so they're kind of becoming one and the same you know technology becomes synonymous with civilization so we need to remove to remove them both and of course Lucky for us, we don't have to do the work twice, you know, since technology and civilization are the same thing, uh, they are the machine, so, you know, just get rid of the machine and that's it, problem solved. Quote, modern civilization, he tells us, is a matrix of forces, including commodity relations, mass communication, urbanization and mass techniques, along with interlocking rival nuclear uh, cy cybernetic states, all of which converge into a global uh, mega machine, in which civilization is a machine that has been a labor camp from its origins, a rigid pyramid of uh, crusting hierarchies, a grid expanding the uh, territory of the inorganic, and a linear progression from Prometheus's theft of fire to the International Monetary Fund. So this, for Bookchin, is completely irrational. Uh, rationality seeks to underline the social processes, the, the social relation, how power is distributed through concrete institutions that we can change. And so what Bradford does is covering those social relations by saying that they don't exist, that it is all just parts of the mega machine. And so here, uh, therefore, just... Uh, here, I mean, we... Um, uh, 
I mean, he uh, he uh, he just continues the uh, the logic of the capital, you know, of capital. He he, he it's uh, Bradford, you know. Bradford continues the logic of the capital. So capitalist ideology works through the naturalization of social relationships. Uh, like capitalism tries to make it seem like the social inequalities between people are not the product of uh, social systems that human beings have built and they can deconstruct to rebuild new ones, but that inequality have always existed like it is something natural. Uh, quote, denouncing technology and civilization as inherently oppressive of humanity, in fact, serves to veil the specific uh, the specific relations that privilege uh, that privilege exploiters over the exploited and hierarch and hierarchs over their uh, that the, the so sorry that the privilege exploiters over uh, the exploited and hierarchs over their subordinates. Like, you know, don't try to change anything. It is just natural that they are rich and, and that they are poor. Uh, like they are, you know, like they are strong and weak. I mean, it's nature. If you try to go against it, you will just make things worse. And so funny how these people always think that if things get worse, it's because someone screwed up with uh, with nature but when things get better that's thanks to that's thanks to nature you know like human uh, like human beings can only engineer the worse never the better so if you if you lose you're responsible but if you win well that's that's god for example you know they would attribute uh, attribute that to uh, to some to some you know tra transcendent entity you know uh, like oh look a society is crumbling someone uh, someone someone is messing with nature uh, and so yeah you can you can go look for all the scapegoats that you want you know it's those transgender oh look our society is doing better now that must be nature you know uh, so anyway so Bradford uh, follows the same logic Technology and civilization, you know, those are messing with nature, and that's why we uh, that's why we are in this in this mess. So, in Marxist language, technology and civilization have become a fetish here, which uh, which means something that conceals the power relations, or uh, you know, or tries to make them acceptable. You know, like commodities, for example, are a fetish in capitalism. The fact that they travel from place to place makes it more and more difficult to apprehend that they are the product of exploitation uh, just like you know contracts between employer uh, employer and employee in exchange for labor is a fetish that that hides the fact that the profit uh, the surplus value uh, that your boss makes comes from uh, the employee's labor that he wasn't paid for uh, and so the rhetoric that civilization and technology are bad that's a fetish too, you know, that's a spectacle that hides the power relation between the capitalist and the worker that dictates how technology is used and for whose benefits. And so as such, lifestyle anarchism is itself a commodity. It is a fetish made to shield from, made to shield from public uh, purview the causal role of capitalist competition in producing the crisis of our times. And so the usage of terms like industrial society instead of capitalism in lifestyle anarchist rhetoric plays the same role. The problem isn't capitalism anymore, it is industry, it's industrial societies. And so we arrive at a critique of postmodernism that replaced concrete forms of power by strange and abstract concepts like that like you know demons threaten the unicity of the subject. Ecology is perhaps the field that suffered the most from this. Uh, what causes ecological disasters uh, is no longer the capital accumulation and the exploitation of labor. It's not, you know, competitive market marketplace. Uh, instead, it is the disenchantment of the world and because of, you know, logocentrism, uh, as if there cannot be any ecological disaster without heavy industry uh, because, you know, people apparently cannot destroy a whole ecosystem with just hatchets and bow arrows apparently and um and so uh and so yeah i mean we uh these people don't seem to know that for example heavy hunting to the point of extinction was common before technology and people been enslaving uh, other people before technology and even before large-scale civilization uh, 
um, and also no one needed a uh, steam engine uh, or you know enormous cities or bureaucrat bureaucracies to quote deforest huge areas of north america and virtually obliterate its aboriginal peoples or erode the soil of entire regions to the contrary even before railroads reached out to uh, to all the parts of the land much of this devastation had already been uh, wrought using simple uh, simple axes black powder muskets horse driven wagons and mole uh, moldboard plows and so denying this and the important role technology plays in emancipating society can be extremely dangerous and so to get away from this matrix of forces Bradford calls for the most uh, radical primitivism possible. Like you go, uh, like you go back to worshiping uh, mother mother goddesses. You worship the earth. You destroy uh, electricity. You know, like kind of like the Amish. And so he is doing the whole quote quasi uh, mystical actu actualizational uh, and anti technological cliches that appear in certain new age environmental cults. The Corollary of anti-technologism and anti-civilizationism anti is primitivist, uh, primitivism and Edenic uh, glorification of prehistory and the desire to somehow return to its putative innocence. So Bradford, like many, uh, like many, have this weird idealization of the past that is basically just, uh, just them projecting their desires onto people who lived thousands of years before them. Uh, primitive people and societies were not seen as what they are, but as you know, uh, extremely smart people who were who were aware of the danger of technology and made the right decision not to use it or to create it. You know, they were they these. The, the, these primitive people were wiser than us. They could, you know, tap into the real wisdom of the world, its reality, and its reality apparently was don't make toasters. Uh, like, you know, Bradford really says this, uh, that primitive people could have made technology if they wanted to, they just chose not to. Uh, primal peoples, uh, he says, refused technology. They min they minimized the relative weight of in the, uh, of instrumental or practical techniques and expanded the importance of ecstatic techniques. Like you know, they prefer to develop ecstatic techniques instead of using technology. You know, like they were aware of that choice. They were also aware of. DNA, I suppose, uh, and you know uh, the drawing of snakes uh, into uh, of drawing the drawing of snakes intertwined uh, that you see sometimes at, in primitive art. Yeah, I mean that means that people back then were aware of DNA and they knew what it was. Really <laughs> cool this representation. So you see the sort of the primary mother and father of humanity emerging from this underlying snake-like entity with its tails tangled together. I think that's a rep I really do believe this, although it's very complicated to explain why. I really believe that's a representation of DNA. So, and that, that representation, that entwined double helix, that is everywhere. And so, why they didn't use technology, you say? Because, well, unlike us, we basic, you know, we, we are materialistic. We have no respect for the inner space uh, that is infinite and connects everything in the world. Primitive people, on the other hand, they knew all about this, you know, and they did it through spirituality and love. Uh, quote, uh, Aboriginal peoples with their anim uh, animistic beliefs were saturated by a love of animal life and wilderness. For them, animals, plants and natural objects were persons of even kin. So, you know, there are some, some other individualist uh, lifestyle anarchists, like for example John, uh, John Zerzan, to whom we will get in a minute, went as far as to say that these primitive people were so loving, so involved and committed to their animism that they reached level, uh, a, an unprecedented, unprecedented level of mysticism and connections with the animal world. You know, quote, they seem to know what it actually felt like to be an elephant, a lion, and antelope, even a, uh, even a uh, boabab tree. So, they were wise 
They were so wise that they knew the things that mattered in life uh, because they were in a state of ecstasy. They were loving and so everything as persons like them. So, uh, so it was, you know, like very cosmo cosmopolitan, very accepting of difference. Uh, and yes, they were peaceful as hell, coexisting without a single conflict. As hunter-gatherers, their lives were probably healthier and peaceful, living then as now on an ample natural lodge, uh, lodges. And if you're not already impressed by our ancestors, they also apparently lived in abundance. Like, you know, primitivist people lived in the primal uh, affluent society, according to, uh, to Bradford and other lifestyle anarchists. You know, for example, Richard Lee, uh, this is another one, uh, who, uh, <clears throat> who was arguing that uh, affluent, because, uh, because its needs, the needs of the hunter-gatherers, are few. All its desires are easily met. It, uh, its, tool kit, uh, its toolkit is elegant and, light uh, and uh, lightweight, its uh, outlook uh, linguistically complex and conceptually profound, yet simple and accessible to all. Its culture is expensive and ecstatic, it is, uh, property, it's property-less and communal, egalitarian and, cooper and cooperative, it is anarchic. Uh, free of work, it is a dancing society, a singing society, a celebrating society, a dreaming society. Like, even when they work, they are playful, you know, like primitive people don't work, okay? They hunt and they gather, why, which according to uh, Bradford was way less tiring than the eight hours work a day, for example. And so, don't you just want to live like them? like to live in abundance because their needs were few and they can be easily met. Uh, not like us, of course, who are greedy and can never be satisfied with what we got because, you know, that's why we're always tired. You know, we overwork ourselves because we're greedy and we're glutens. Uh, and so they think that they're, uh, the, 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 the primitive people, on the other hand, they think with their heart while we think with our bellies. You know, this is the kind of rhetoric we are dealing with here. And get this, they don't think with their bellies so much that even when there is a famine, well, they don't give a damn. You know, I mean, it's okay for them, they're still happy even when there is no food. Quote, uh, he does co compa uh, compassionately concede that primal society was capable of experiencing occasional hunger. This hunger, however, was really symbolic and self-inflicted. You see, because primal people sometimes choose hunger to, to uh, enhance uh, interrelatedness to, uh, to play or to see visions. So, what do we have with this uh, portrait of the noble savage? Well, we have wisdom, as like general wisdom about reality, and also practical wisdom. They lived in abundance of love, as well as abundance of food. They were egalitarian, peaceful, playful. Uh, occasion uh, occasionally, uh, they were ascetics, but not out of necessity, but out of, you know, choice to strengthen their, uh, to strengthen their bonds. And so you can ask, well, can it get even more uh, idyllic than this? Well, yes, it can. And this is where we're going to talk about John uh, Zerzan. And so uh, Bookchin uh, presents him as the anti-civilizational primitivist par excellence for whom the absence of speech, language, uh, and writing is a positive boon like you know the, like this uh, th this one uh, took it to the extreme like now even speech as such is seen as bad and therefore it cannot be used by primitive people and this is again by choice you know like human beings were capable of speech they just decided not to use it because they were aware of its danger you know Quote, intelligence informed by the, uh, by the success and satisfaction of hunter-gatherer existence is the very reason for the pronounced absence of progress. Division of labor, domestication, symbolic culture, these were eventually, uh, evidently refused until very recently. The Homo sapiens long chose nature over 
culture. And so to quote Bookchin, to summarize uh, Zerzan's thought, in short, hominids were capable of symbols, speech, and writing, but deliberately rejected them, since they could understand one another and their environment instinctively without recourse to, uh, to them. And as you have to conclude, we must be very ashamed of ourselves compared to our primitive ancestors. I mean, you have to marvel at how wise Homo habilis, for example, should have been, uh, should have been for, uh, for being capable of using, uh, of using speech and any sophisticated style of communication we, that we use today, but deliberately chose not to because of the infinite wisdom he has in his brain, which was half the size of a modern human brain, by the way. Um, but for for uh, for Zervan, uh, Zerzen, sorry, for Zerzen, uh, primitive people were basically like monks who take silence vows. You know, like they can talk if they want it, but you see, they were so profound and their thought was so deep that they knew that speech would be a regression for them in terms of tapping into the essence of you know the of the of the real real reality <laughs> you know um, and so uh, and so yeah, I mean we have to uh, and so we have to affirm that you know all of a sudden at one point uh, it was only when those vows you know were broken that tragedy began but then if everything was so good uh, why were those vows broken in the first place right well only God knows, and apparently Zerzan too. Uh, what you need to know is that what well, it happened. That's <laughs> that's all you have to know. Like the emergence of symbolic culture with its inherent will to manipulate and control soon opened the door to the dom domestication of nature. After two million years of human life within the bounds of nature in balance with other wild species, agriculture changed our lifestyle, our way of adapting in an unprecedented way. Never before uh, has such a radical change occurred in a species so utterly and so swiftly. Self-domestication through language, ritual and art inspired the, ta uh, the taming of plants and uh, animals that followed. And so, um, what do we have to do then? Uh, how can we uh, even repent for this original sin, right? How can we recover the uh, paradise that we lost? Well, we have to abandon technology and civilization, speech and language altogether, and be content w with the few needs that we, uh, that we can have. So, living according to nature, basically, and uh, what we will get is life before domestication, agriculture, largely, largely one of leisure, intimacy with nature, sensual wisdom, sexual equality, and health. And so, if this is not an Eden, I don't know what is. But, as you can guess from, from, uh, from my tone and uh, from Bookshins, it's all bullshit. You know, Bookshin starts by telling us that uh, what... Uh, what, what are the things that are wrong with this, uh, with this approach? And first, uh, it doesn't really tell us which hunter-gatherer we're, uh, we're looking at and at what period. You know, like prehistory is a very long time. I mean, it's longer than history. Uh, and I don't think, you know, that 300 years of hunter-gathering uh, hunter was all sunshine and rainbows. You know, I mean, that's how long uh, prehistory is. So, oh yeah, and not to mention that human beings had different species as well, you know, with different toolkits, with different artistic abilities, and also with different capacities for speech. There would seem to be no difference between Homo sapiens, Neo, uh, Neander Neanderthals, Homo habilis, uh, Homo erectus, etc., in the primitivist, uh, primitivist view. Uh, quote, all, all early Homo sapiens, in his view, were, uh, were possessed of the, of the mental and physical capacities of Homo... Uh, sorry, all Homo species uh, were possessed of the mental and physical capacities of Homo sapiens and furthermore lived in primal bliss for more than two million, uh, two million years. 
So Bradford, uh, Richard Lee and uh, Zerzan and many others from uh, Fifth Estate seem to take prehistory as a homogeneous lump as if you know any period of prehistory at any place would be the same. Uh, we'll find human beings getting high and all be peaceful communists no matter where you look at prehistory. And so in reality, primitive societies were formed through long historical processes and new countless changes done through the contact with other cultures and other social organizations, and they were not always peaceful. Like, clearly, no, they were, <laughs> they were not. It would be therefore silly to try to find an origin in those primitive societies. They themselves were the products of other societies and cultures that were very different from one another. Uh, they were borrowing and assimilating myths and practices into their own. Uh, I mean, that's how, you know, uh, cultures evolve. So as Bookshink says, quoting anthropologist uh, Clifford uh, Geertz, uh, all these people are in fact products of large-scale processes of social change which have made them and continue to make them what they are. Has come, to, uh, has come as something of a shock that has induced a virtual crisis in the field of ethnography. And so this brings us to the second criticism, which is the extent which prehistoric hunter-gatherers or for, uh, foragers at uh, various times lived in non-hierarchical societies. Lifestyle anarchism is basically telling us that primitive people had no hierarchies, that they were uh, extremely egalitarian and that they didn't care about uh, social status. But, as attested, for example, with the burial sites at, at Sungir, in which rich collection of jewelry, lances, ivory spears, and uh, headed clothing at the grave sites of two adolescents, suggest the existence of high-status family lines long before human beings settled down to food cultivation. And, and yeah, I mean, Sure, uh, while that can be true for, for some, like some were indeed, uh, were certainly egalitarian, uh, perhaps many, it cannot account for all social organization of hunter-gatherers that existed through tens of thousands of years, like hierarchies existed back then and they existed in variety, just like, you know, the modern hunter-gatherers that we still have today, they have hierarchies that include slavery. An example is the Yuk, uh, the I'm not sure of the pronunciation, but it is the the Yukwai of the Amazons, I think, who uh, who despite being the most primitive in Bradford's and uh, and uh, in Brad, Bradford's and uh, Zerzan's terms, uh, they you know like like they produce no fire, they have no watercraft, they have no domestic animals, you know, not even not even dogs, they have no stones, no ritual specialist, and only a rudimentary cosmology, they have no crops, no nothing, they just live out uh, of hunting game whenever they find it, but still they maintain the institution of hereditary slavery, dividing their society into a privileged elite stratum and a scorned laboring slave group. And so a practice, we're told from Bookshin, quoting an anthropologist who studied them in the 1950s, uh, Eline, uh, Eline Sturman, was inherited from, an, uh, from a slave-holding pre-Columbian society. So as Bookshin says, most cultures in the Paleolithic were probably relat relat rel uh, relatively uh, egalitarian, but hierarchy seems to have existed even in the late Paleolithic, with, uh, with marked uh, variation in degree, type, and scope of domination that cannot be uh, subsumed under rhetorical uh, pawns to, uh, pawns to uh, Paleolithic egalitarianism. And so, it is true that uh, Paleolithic societies were re uh, relatively egalitarian, and their hierarchy models were probably not as oppressive as, you know, ours, uh, Bookchin himself admits that indeed anarchists and humans in general have a lot to learn from hunter-gathering uh, cultures in terms of cooperation and mutual care. Uh, he even asserts that learning about primitive people is necessary for ecological societies. I mean, remember that Bookchin is uh, uh, Bookchin's main issue is ecology. Quote: There is very much we can learn from pre-literate cultures particularly about the, uh, about the uh, mutability of what is commonly 
called human nature. Their spirit of in-group cooperation and, in the best of cases, egalitarian outlook are not only admirable, but provide compa compelling evidence of the ma malleability of human behavior in contrast to the myth that competition and greed are innate human attributes. Uh, uh, feuded their practices of uh, of isofruct uh, and the inequality of equals out of great relevance of an ecological society. But it is important to remember a few things. First, that egalitarianism and cooperation, which true existed in primitive uh, in primitive society, and to great extent only applied to uh, the members of the group. Uh, I mean, it only applied to the members of the group or the tribe or the clan. Like within their intimate circles, they probably probably lived in peace and shared uh, meals, respected one another, etc. But but when it comes to outsiders, they were often warlike, even sometimes genocidal in their effort, uh, efforts to dispo to dispossess them and uh, appropriate their land. So even if the primitive didn't have hierarchies. We have to remember that a lack of hierarchy isn't the pinnacle of human life, you know? Like, egality isn't just, you know, some goal we, we seek for its own sake. If we're equal but we're all starving, then equality is kind of worthless. And so having no hierarchies doesn't mean that the primitive people were living in an idyllic, uh, an idyllic life. Um, and if we don't find any traces of massive genocide, like, you know, uh, like like uh, of the scale of the Holocaust, we do find traces of violence, of violent killings, uh, sometimes, you know, of a whole tribe. And, and so that doesn't mean that because, that's because of the goodwill uh, and the ethnic, uh, and the ethics of, you sorry, um, I mean, if the reason why we don't find a massive, you know, uh, genocide, like, you know, the level of the Holocaust, uh, doesn't mean that that's because of the goodwill and the ethics of the primitive people. You know, who would know uh, when they when they would go too far, for example, but because, you know, organiz uh, orga organizing a genocide requires means that are obviously beyond the reach of the hunter-gatherer, okay? So instead, they genocide tribes or, you know, local or local people. And, uh, and they would probably uh, wipe each other out if they didn't, you know, uh, like in, like in the case of the Indian tribes, for example, the uh, I think it's the uh, it's pronounced the Anasazi, uh, Anasazi and their neighbors in the southwest. Uh, they they made uh, the what we call the Oroquois uh, con uh, Confederacy. Uh, unlike you know the other tribes of Mohawks and uh, Hurons, which led to the near extermination uh, and the flight of the remnant Huron communities, you know. So just because they didn't build railroads and big cities doesn't mean that they were morally superior. Uh, so, um, or that they didn't see, you know, fellow human beings as enemies that we have to get rid of, you know, over food or uh, territory. Quote, many American Indian tribes seem to have exhausted local food animals and had to migrate to new territories to gain the material uh, means of life. It would be surprising indeed if they did not engage in warfare to displace the original occupants. Uh, and so that doesn't, of course, exclude, like we said earlier, uh, speci uh, spe uh, speci speci speciesides. Like when you uh, when you kill you know a whole uh, a whole species like genocide speciesides I think that's how it is pronounced. Um, I mean you have cases in which hunter gatherers hunted an animal popul population to its extinction. Take the Indians again as an example. Quote: Remote ancestors may well have pushed some of the great North American mammals uh, of the last ice age, uh, ice age pro notably mammoths, mastodons, uh, bisons, horses, and camels, to extinction. Uh, tricky accumulated bones of bisons are still discernible in sites that suggest mass killings and assembly line butchering in a number of American uh, arrows. 
And so it is pretty difficult to argue that these were affluent societies when we literally are dealing with evidence that suggests that these people were involved with the extinction of species and that they moved local populations away. So as explained by Bookchin, evidence point that these people didn't live in abundance but were suffering from scarcity and they died quite young, like their, like their children uh, died before adulthood, they, quote, had an average lifespan of about 30 years, infant mortality was high, the people were subject to disease and hunger during lean uh, seasons. And we now know that the diseases that they mostly died, that they mostly uh, died from, uh, I mean, those are diseases that they didn't, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, they, they died from it, so they didn't recover from, uh, from, was not due to poor diet or harsh weather or infected wounds or whatever. It's also due to the physical toils uh, their bodies underwent, you know, like, as Bookchin uh, quotes from Christopher, uh, Christopher uh, Stringer and uh, Clive uh, Gamble's book In Search of the Neanderthals, uh, Neanderthals uh, the high incidence of degener degenerative joint disease in the Neander Neanderthals is perhaps not surprising given what we know of the hard lives that they had and, we, uh, and the wear and tear this uh, would have produced on their bodies. But the prevalence of serious injuries is more surprising and indicates just how dangerous life was even for those who did not manage to reach old age in Neanderthal societies. So, that goes for the myth of they were basically leisure societies and engage in fun and playful activities. Actually, no, the conditions our ancestors lived in were horrible and they had no reason or time for caring about nature. You know, like nature wasn't their friend, you know, for nature is the friend of no one. Um, they didn't really care about nature uh, or preserve, uh, preserving wildlife like we do today. They just saw animals as meat, you know, as, uh, as nothing more than that, just, you know, meat. And they hunted game at every occasion. And they didn't get embarrassed of using any necessary means to do it. You know, I mean, when Homo erectus, for example, discovered fire, as Bookchin argues, he didn't use uh, the fire just to warm himself or heat up some, some soup or cook, uh, cook some meal, but, uh, you know, that, you know, but... Like they didn't use it to cook some some meat, some, some meat for example, that they gathered uh, with the blessing of the very few animals they have uh, they have hunted. Uh, and remember, they know that they feel, and and these people are supposed to know what the animals are feeling and what it's like to be uh, to be them. Uh, rather, they used fire to burn down forests, sometimes for their own protection, uh, as forests can be home for predators, if not you know demons or evil spirits to. Be, uh, to be feared or you know uh, to get you know the the animals the, the game uh, out of the forest so that they can hunt them uh, hunt them more uh, more easily and so the fire was used as uh, Bokshin says for uh, stampeding game animals over cliffs or into natural enclosures where they could uh, be easily slaughtered so as Bookchin also says, if they imagine, if they imaginatively peopled the animal world with anthropomorphic attributes, as they surely did, it would have been to communicate with it. Um, it would have, it would have been to communicate with it with an end toward manipulating it, not simply toward revering, revering it. So whatever harmony with nature they had, if the, if the term harmony is right, that cannot be a sign that they value or worship nature or even that they saw nature as distinct from culture, you know, like, uh, like, we, do, like we do now, uh, let alone, you know, respect and didn't see it as a tool for domination. Uh, quote, it is not likely that our remote ancestors view the natural world in a manner any less instrumental than did people in historical cultures. The uh, reverence for life of prehistoric people thus reflected a highly pragma pragmatic concern for enhancing and controlling the food supply, not a, uh, not a love for animals, forests, or mountains. And so, 
an instrumental mind isn't limited to modern and civil uh, and civilized uh, people, but to anyone who has a stomach that can get hungry, to anyone who 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 needs to be protected from harsh weather and from wild animals, as demonstrated by the actual primitive and nomadic people still living today. Uh, quote. Uh, who often deal with, deal rather harshly with work and game animals. The uh, the Uteri forest uh, pygmies, for example, tormented and uh, ensnared game quite sadistically, and Eskimos commonly mal uh, maltreated their huskies. And so it is also worth noting that, like we mentioned earlier, that the primitive people... Um, the primitive people that the lifestyle uh, anarchist worships was a product of history. So too are the modern day primitives. These people did not choose that lifestyle, but for many of them, they were forced into it due to political and economic disasters. Many were from societies with big economies that were just crushed under some circumstances, like for example, colonialism. Uh, Bookchin gives the example of the San people of the uh, Kalahari or the Bushmen, uh, who now are nomadic hunter-gatherers living in the African desert. Uh, the lifestyle of those people was once centered around gardening and hunting, herding and farming. They were part of a massive agricultural network that, you know, extended all the way to uh, the Indian Ocean. They hunted elephants for their, for their tusks, from which they could make, you know, things out of ivory and sell them. And the reason why they are now hunter-gatherers was, according to Bakshin, quoting uh, from another guy, uh, Edwin uh, Will, uh, Wilson, economic changes in the late 19th century, which was created by the collapse of the mercantile capital in terms of the social policies and, eco and economies of the colonial um, uh, era and its uh, aftermath. Their, their appearance as for... Uh, foragers uh, is a function of their uh, of their relegation to an underclass in the playing out of a of historical processes that began before the current millennium and culminated in the early uh, decades of this uh, century and not to mention that the primitive didn't even respect the earth itself as they engage in local agricultural temporal activities. Take, for example, quote, around Lake, uh, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, this uh, Cuaro in the, in the central Mexican highlands, before the Spanish conquest, prehistoric land use was not conserv conservationist in practice, but caused high rates of soil er erosion. Indeed, uh, aboriginal farming practices could be as damaging as any pre-industrial land use in the old world. Uh, other studies have shown that forest overcleaning over and the failure of subs subs subsistence agriculture undermined Mayan society and contributed to its collapse. So, clearly, this paradise that the lifestyle anarchist talks about, uh, that our primitive ancestor used to live in, was clearly humanized. You know, it was pragmatic and instrumental, and those noble savages wouldn't have hesitated to use the massive industrial technologies that we have today for those ends. You know, so the speculations of the life anarchist about the life of the noble savage have to take enormous leaps of faith that defy anthropological consensus. There's a lot that we cannot know about hunter-gatherer societies because they were marked by oral traditions, and as such, we have no writing records that can indicate much about their social organization. You know, like lifestyle anarchists would find in this a proof that primitive societies were egalitarian because civilization and writing came together. I mean, this is familiar to Jean-Jacques Rousseau's uh, theory of the origins of language. Like when language was created, that's when we began comparing each other uh, and, com and competition arose. Uh, and then, you know, with the invention of writing, that's when we have civilization and straight up, you know, rigid and fixed hierarchies. But there is no evidence that that, uh, that, that is true. Like, you know, what's the evidence to suggest that in oral traditions you have egalitarian societies or that primitive people would be, you know, conceptually profound? 
you know, uh, like nothing would let us conclude uh, conclude that, you know, and as a matter of fact, according to Bookchin, least of all is oral transmitted history subject to demanding critique, but instead easily becomes a tool for elite seers and shamans who far from being proto-poets, as Bradford calls them, seem to have used their knowledge to serve their own social interests, you know. So what it looks like is something akin to presentism, like when you project the standards of your own time on those of the past. Like style anarchists associate poetry, for example, with freedom, with imagination, and they take it as an opposition to rationality and total totalitarianism, and so imagination is linked with, uh, with the occult, to the unconscious, to spirituality, and so anyone who is into that shit well, must be a poet, and therefore they must be free. Yeah, I mean, the people of pre-agrarian times must have been poets like we understand poetry today. But truth is, primitive people certainly did not think of poetry or spirituality or prophecy like the lifestyle anarchists think about those things. You know, they mostly saw them as social markers to justify their position in hierarchies and serve their interest rather than, you know, for spiritual awakening or for peace and virtue or whatever Bradford is talking about. And was no and that was no proof of their, you know, great intelligence. So, on the contrary, Bookchin argues that oral traditions were filled with dangerous superstitions on which, you know, the priests, the seers, the prophets, the shamans played and maintained their authority, which would likely have crushed any sense of individuality and uniqueness that the lifestyle anarchist uh, in the, you know, Stern Sternarian tradition holds so dear. And so the harsh environment and the, the, the fear-mongering that manifested in their irrational beliefs probably produced hostility towards individuality. You know, like individuality or eccentricity were certainly viewed as anti-social behavior that would threaten the cohesion of the group that relied on each other for survival. You know, a survival that certainly also depended on respecting the authoritative figures in the tribe and to never question their, uh, their authority, you know, unless you will unleash the wrath of, you know, the evil spirits. Quote, Although uh, contemporary primal co communities have produced strongly etched individuals, the power of custom and the high degree of group solidarity imp uh, impelled by demanding conditions allow little leeway for expensively individualistic behavior. And so superstitions can make you very gullible and extremely vulnerable to, uh, to um, malevolent people. If your priests uh, can at least genuinely, uh, genuinely care, uh, care for your, for your well-being, well, well your enemies certainly wouldn't, and they will use your superstition against you. And Bookchin gives the example of the tragedy that happened to the Indians, to the America to the American Indians at Wounded Knee. The imperialist gave white shirts to the Indians, telling them that they are ghost shirts, and if you wear them, well, you cannot be hit by bullets. Like the bullets are gonna, <laughs> the bullets are going to go through you, you know. Like, but you you're not going to be you're not going to be hurt by the bullets, and so the onslaught that uh, the onslaught and like, like the slaughter that happened in 1890 at Wounded Knee was the result of the Indian actually believing that stuff. They wore the shirts and they went with bows and, uh, bow, bows and arrows to the battlefield against, you know, guns and machine guns. Hence, Bookchin, you know, uh, ends this uh, section uh, of the book arguing for the necessity that we take our human nature as it is. Like, we're social beings and our nature is to transform the environment. Like, humans, as Bookchin writes, innovate and create uh, a new world, not only to discover their own powers as human beings, but to make the world around them more suitable for their own development, both as individuals and as a species. And this is not to say that what we're doing right now, um, like we've, we've, like, I mean, what we are doing right now, we've been doing it for forever, so everything is cool. On the contrary, Bookshin um, says that it is important to remember that because right 
right now our society despite its benefit it's still harsh and irrational like the primitive world we have uh, we have descended we have descended from so we we have to innovate and to and to create a new world based on rationality equality without privileges uh, actual abundance and ecological awareness we have quote the ability to change the world um, uh, yeah, we have the ability to change the word and it is a natural endowment the product of human biological uh, evolution not simply a product of technology rationality and civilization so if one model is still entrenched in the superstitious primitive world it is capitalism like the lifestyle anarchist capitalism also has a mystification of the primitive world like we take it as completely uh, harshness, harshness, competitiveness, fear of outsiders, endless toil, ecological disasters, uh, species going extinct, etc. It is capitalism that looks like the primitives and want to assert that we are primitives. You know, uh, both lifestyle anarchist and capitalist say that we have to be like the primitives. You know, uh, problem is that maybe the capitalist is more right about the primitives than the lifestyle anarchist like the only thing they agree upon regarding the primitive the primitive is its irrationality you know problem is they both celebrate that irrationality you know uh, unfortunately the irrationality of the primitive is closer to the irrationality of the capitalist than the bohemian lifestyle uh, anarchist like both hold on a fictitious origins that would uh, reveal to us a human nature that is unchangeable, that is fixed. Either we are, uh, we're poets that have fallen from the Garden of Eden and must regain innocence but by living like the nomads uh, and the hobos, or, you know, this is the capitalist take on the, the primitivist, or we're psychopathic monsters always trying to dominate everything to satisfy our, uh, our needs. Quote, just as capitalism threatens to unravel natural history by bringing it back to simpler, less differentiated geological and zoological era, so anti-civilizational uh, lifestyle anarchist is complicit with capitalism in bringing the human spirit and its history back to a less developed, less determined, uh, pre-lapsarian -lap uh, world, the supposedly innocent pre-technological and pre-civilization pre-civilizatory society that existed before humanity's fall, uh, fall from grace. And so, lifestyle anarchism fails for Bookchin because it is incapable of thinking clearly uh, because it doesn't want to think clearly. Uh, lifestyle anarchism wants something else, like an, uh, it wants an eternal present. Uh, Bookchin uses the metaphor of the lotus eater uh, from uh, the Odyssey to represent the perfect embodiment of a lifestyle anarchist. Quote, like the lotus eaters in Homer's Odyssey, humans are authentic when they live in an eternal present without past or future, untroubled by memory or idea ideation, free of tradition and unchallenged by becoming. And so the Lotus Eaters are a bunch of junkies uh, in the Odyssey, and Odysseus, uh, the Greek hero, uh, he meets them on his journey to go back to his home in uh, Ithaca, and they eat a plant that puts them in some sort of a trance, and that's what they do all day. You know, like, and so Odysseus, of course, is horrified by them and has only one thing in mind, getting the fuck out. So Odysseus is a king and he must go back home because when well, he has responsibilities, uh, his kingdom is falling apart, uh, you know, because a bunch of suitors are trying to marry his wife Penelope and want to take his place. Um, and so, you know, the, the suitors are like the Lotus Eaters. They only care about their own pleasure. They are chaotic. They are drunk in power and don't care about you know the state of their of their city um, if people are hungry or dying young as long as they have odysseus's throne they're happy and content you know uh, i mean no there's no need for something else you know i mean you have whole population who's, who's suffering all you care about is just take the throne and so the lotus eaters though they don't seek power are no less irresponsible and dangerous for odysseus uh, for uh, uh, for has either to enjoy the because they had 
it's either you enjoy the drugs there and live for the rest of your life as a junkie on an island somewhere or go back home and restore you know the order of uh, of the city you know I mean that's the choice that that you have and so as Bookchin reminds his reader about the cry of the first international uh, it is still shouted by social anarchists there are no rights without duties no duties without rights and so to reject that is absurd for social anarchism uh, it's like you know say uh, staying with the lotus uh, the lotus eaters so staying there means that odysseus has to succumb to amnesia to social amnesia his mind is guilt-free he has no memory of his past he forgets about penelope about his son telemachus uh, who are you know doing their best risking their lives to keep the suitors away from the throne uh, he becomes free of having you know to envision better futures for his society he is freed from tradition like his role as a king on which you know the whole city relies uh, he doesn't have to endure change anymore he can stay in one state of ecstasy forever and so once the self has ridden itself uh, from all the ties with society with tradition with memory uh, and becoming and, be, and also becoming, then according to the lifestyle anarchist, the self can be authentic. And so indeed, authentic here means without ties. It means without even ties with reality. You know, it is the state of dream uh, that we mentioned with Hakim Bey, a state of immediacy rather than reflection of a naive one-sided relationship between mind and reality. So the lifestyle anarchist doesn't have to be challenged by reality, doesn't have to adjust his mind to reality in order to change it. Like to adjust your mind to reality is like saying, okay, so this is what reality looks like. I have to get it right so I can change it for the better. Uh, I see that there are, you know, injustices, I see there are ecological disasters everywhere, I see there, are, there is exploitation, racism, sexism, homophobia, uh, speciesism, etc. I have to understand what are the mechanisms behind those things so I can come up with, uh, with plans in which those injustices are removed or are at least considerably reduced uh, or channeled in ways that would compensate and create more positive outcomes for everyone. And so in the case of the lifestyle anarchist, well, there is no past, like realizing that our mind is not rightfully adjusted to the present, the reality of now. Uh, when you have you know false beliefs about reality you are in the past so you need to realize that there is a gap between the mind and reality and that reality is kind of a bit ahead of you you know and so you need to bridge that gap by getting rid of the false beliefs and get closer to reality and as you're getting closer you start thinking about what reality can be in the future and so what the lifestyle anarchist does is claiming that mind and reality actually correspond to each, uh, to each other, you know? Like from the get-go, we have to maintain that relationship at all costs, you know? In other words, the lifestyle anarchist can never be wrong. Whatever uh, comes to his mind must be real, you know? It's, uh, it's like, you know, an idea pops and, yeah, whoop, it's true, you know? And some, like, you know, Sterner himself, didn't even bother with reality altogether or with truth. He viewed them as what the mind makes, what the mind decides, what reality is, what truth is. Quote, truth cannot step forward as you do, cannot move, change, develop. Truth awaits and recruits everything from you, and itself is only through you, for it exists only in your head. So then there is no objective reality anymore and without objective reality, well, there is no social movement uh, that can be possible because all social change would be impossible then. <coughs> if reality and truth don't exist, that they are whatever you decide, then why bother with social change, right? Whatever pops is real, so we can just tell Sterner that whenever, whenever someone steps on his ego, all he has to do is to imagine that no one stepped on his ego and he'll be fine, right? <laughs> like he's not going to retaliate or anything, you know, just, just one of the many contradictions in the unique and his own, you know. Um, and so another contradiction is given by Bookchin in his critique of Nietzsche, who is also a kind of Sterner, Sternerian 
and he thinks that truth and reality is whatever you make them to be. So Bookchin says, following Nietzsche's unrelent uh, unrelenting logic, we are left with a self that not only essentially creates its own reality, but also must justify its own existence as more than a mere interpretation. Such uh, as mere interpretation, such egoism thus annihilates the ego itself, which vanishes into the mist of Stirner's own unstated premises. So, you get it, like. If you say that reality and truth is whatever the mind decides, doesn't the mind also decide that it exists? I mean, clearly, if we have a mind, so the mind is real. But if everything real is made up by the mind, and the mind is real, then the mind is made up by the mind. And if whatever is made up by the mind isn't real, like it doesn't exist, and the mind is made up by the mind, then the mind is not real. You know, uh, like that's like that's a big contradiction. You know, or if they don't dare to own up to their contradiction, they uh, if they thought uh, if they uh, if they throw, for example, some truth on you, and you say. No, it's not. It's not true. Then, ironically, you're the fascist who is hindering their creativity, you know, uh, their imagination, like uh, their own freedom and their own and their own ego. Uh, the lifestyle anarchist, after all, he's a he's a free thinker, you know. I mean, and, and you wouldn't get it. You, know, you wouldn't get how how deep it is, and that's too bad because, well, that future in which you think of better society, that's uh, that's what makes your imagination meaningful. Actually, you know, so Bookchin doesn't reduce the role of imagination in social movements. On the contrary, he wants it to reach its fullest potential, and not like the social, the uh, the lifestyle, sorry, the lifestyle anarchist uh, that leaves it to uh, flourish on a unmediated experience with an uh, unnuanced oneness. So, you know, like when you when you offer some criticism to a college student, for example, in the humanities. And they suddenly get all defensive and be like, "You don't understand my genius. Uh, you are an old reactionary. You just want to crush my imagination." Um, criticism is supposed to provide you with the tools to expand your imagination, you know, not and not to limit it. But if, uh, but for the lifestyle anarchist, any advice, any criticism, any tool is a sign of authority. It is a sign that you want to. Uh, think in the place uh, of you know the, the of the lifestyle anarchist, and that you don't see uh, that he is immediately tapping into the essence of things, um, not like you who need to go through so much rationalization, so much technology, and so much civilization to arrive at what he genuinely uh, and int intuitively gets uh, can tap can tap into. You know that's how. That's how close his mind is to reality, you know? And the problem, of course, is that his mind doesn't relate to reality at all. I mean, I mean, he believes that his mind is tapping into reality, but there is no reality anymore, but simply his mind or the image that he projects onto his mind. Like, even his mind is concealed from him, uh, all he has is just his ego, his self-image. He portrays himself as having a deep mind, uh, like, look at my mind, I'm so cool, I'm so deep. Uh, but yeah, but being an image of, uh, of himself, lifestyle, anarchism becomes purely aesthetic, you know, and needs desperately to portray that, uh, that, that aestheticism as opposed to rationality and organized activism. Uh, like, he's a whole, uh, he's on a whole other level uh, than you with uh, your social and political programs, with you know, um, uh, uh, with one, with, like 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 this is like this is the like this is the deal with lifestyle anarchist. With one graffiti, he can achieve more autonomy and freedom than you will ever do with all of your pamphlets, articles, books academic papers, years of activism, years of being involved in uh, political activities and political circles, etc. So, to quote Bookchin, lifestyle anarchism by a, by a sailing organization, progr programmatic commitment and serious social analysis apes the worst aspect of situ uh, situationist aesthetism without 
adhering to the project of building a movement. And so those, like building a movement and all of that, those things are beneath him. You know, that's just herd mentality while he is the Obermensch, of course, you know. And so the ego of the lifestyle anarchist is, like we said before, uh, it's the, the, the fetishism of today. It is what conceals from his eyes the superstructures and the mechanism under his feet, moving him like a marionette. Uh, the, the, the lifestyle anarchist is a bourgeois who seeks to remain a bourgeois, who has no interest in social struggles or social emancipation. Quote, all claims to autonomy notwithstanding, this middle-class rebel, with or without a brick in hand, is uh, entirely captive to the sub to the subterranean market forces that occupy all allegedly free terrains of modern la social life, from food cooperatives to rural com uh, communes. And so, of course, the lifestyle anarchist isn't going to do anything about those forces, since he doesn't see them. He is so abstract, so disembodied, that in the end, the individual ego becomes the supreme temple of reality, excluding history and becoming, demo uh, and becoming democracy and responsibility. So he is therefore taken out from the spatial, the, temp uh, the, the temporal, and the historic. The content, the content of his mind has no context, you know, it has no place, nor time, uh, and it is not the product of history or of tradition or pre precedent cultures, it just pops out of the blue, and it is completely disembodied. And like the, uh, like the, the Lotus uh, Eaters, Bookshin argues that the lifestyle anarchists have created their own paradise where they can get into, uh, into when they eat their, their, their Lotus to experience their brief but total moments of freedom, you know? And that uh, paradise is called Needle Park. It's in uh, Zunich, which was created in 18, uh, 1984 after a series of youth insurrections a la Foucault and the Bay. And now it is, quote, a notorious cocaine and crack hangout established by the city's officials to, uh, to allow uh, addicted young people to destroy themselves legally. And more sites are becoming more and more accessible for TAZs, for TAS experimentations, and for TAS uh, enthusiasts. The Roman holiday in today's American uh, cities flourishes on crack, uh, thuggery, insensitivity, stupidity, primitivism, anti-civilizationism, anti-rationalism, and a sizable dose of anarchy conceived as chaos. And so, uh, hence, it is the result of lifestyle anarchism with the postmodern rejection of reason and the emphasis on immediate gratification and desire and jouissance, the glorification of what Marx called the lumpen proletariat. So they're defined as the dangerous class, the social scum, that passively uh, rotten mass uh, thrown off by the lowest layers of the old society may here and there be swept into the movement by a proletarian revolution. Its conditions of life, however, prepare it far more for the part of a bribe to a tool for reactionary uh, intrigue. So that's how Marx and Engels define the Lumpen proletariat from their um, communist ma manifesto. And so basically the Lumpen proletariat is the lowest, uh, the, the, it's the most marginalized people, group of, uh, group of people that are, you know, so vulnerable, if you want, that they are just in a, in a situation of constant survival, okay? So these are like, you know, junkies, these are uh, extremely poor uh, criminals, uh, drug dealers, these are people that you cannot, uh, that you not, cannot rely on if you want to create a social, uh, a social movement, because the only thing that that they care about is just, you know, uh, surviving like right now. Um, either, you know, uh, either, you know, you know, I just care about the present, uh, I can, they, they cannot have any prospect for the future, or simply because, you know, they just want um, the pain to end in, in case that they are, you know, drug addicts or, uh, or things like that. And so because of that, they are willing to be bribed, they are willing to go to whomever has uh, the most to offer, and so they can be um, they can be a tool for the uh, for for the reaction to destroy any uh, any social any social movement. And so 
these people well they should be taken uh, they should be taken care of they you know we should we should care about the about, about those people rehabilitate them and all uh, etc and not you know like uh, like the right would uh, would want like just to get rid of them but we cannot also you know glorify them and take them as an example which is precisely what the lifestyle anarchist does you know they they take the lumpen proletariat as uh, the uh, the example for them and so all of this according to uh, to Bookchin has less to do with the need to create a free society than with you know a brutal war over who uh, who is to to share in the available spoils from the sale of drugs human bodies uh, exorbitant loans and let us not forget junk for junk bonds and international currencies so it is a return towards uh, Animality, a regression towards instinct. Bookchin wants that in such uh, the, that in such returns to brutal an uh, animality and a life in which everything is determined by instinct. Well, we will not return to a primitivist state per se, as in the hunter, the hunter, uh, the hunter gatherers. I mean, Bookchin is is war uh, he's warning against. I, I, I think I said he wants. No, he he warns. <laughs> that you know we return to a hunter uh, to a primitivist state uh, because you know that already is bad just on its own but what Bookchin is more worried about is that when instincts uh, immediacy become the primary uh, criteria for what has value in a society then what we're looking at is a gateway towards eugenics uh, in such states, uh, quote, authenticity is guided more by genes than by brains, and nothing could be more unrelenting in its sheer obedience to biochemical imperatives such as DNA or more in, uh, in contrast to uh, the creativity, ethics, and mutual, uh, mutuality opened by culture and struggles for a rational civilization. Like, the lifestyle anarchist is the mindset for all reactionaries and conservatives because all of his beliefs are about one thing we should do absolutely nothing let's just dream and fantasize thus nothing changes it wants to stay in a primal mode of being that is eternal that constantly repeats and reproduces itself in bliss like the kind of nature that he imagines uh, the nurturing and loving one not the one that <clears throat> that works through evolution and biology and through natural selection and also as such lifestyle anarchism divest divest mind of its creative uniqueness and its freedom to intervene into the natural world and so indeed the most primitivists of modern societies were not at all the bohemian hippies but the fascist bookchin is careful uh, but it, it, it was the fascist that bookchin is warning against um, bookchin is careful in bringing in bringing to our attention the similarities between lifestyle anarchism when it comes to technology and nature and the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century you know so Although it is true that the fascists ha would have locked up lifestyle anarchists or killed them because they would be considered as deviant or immoral, we uh, know how fascists have a weird boner for order. So, uh, I mean, the, their boner is so hard that they would that they confuse it with chaos all the time. Like it is hard to deny their similarities on these two issues, however, uh, which are technology civilization and nature when technology is removed from the social world uh, like we've seen it becomes this weird mythical entity that all totalitarian regimes fed on quote the stalinist hypostasization of technology has served extremely reactionary ends the idea that technology has a life on its own is deeply rooted in the conservative german romanticism of the last century in uh, and in the writing of martin heidegger and uh, friedrich uh, younger which fed into national socialist ideology however much the nazis honored uh, their anti-technological ideology in the in the breach so we know that when people are living in precarity and they're uh and they're 
uh, and they're uh, sorry. Um, and they're feeling like they don't matter anymore, they'll just turn to some, uh, to the most, you know, reactionary policymakers who promised them a return to the times where they had jobs and freedoms and dignity before the machines came, uh, came and put us out of work and before the invasion of, you know, the immigrants or, you know, the filth of some impure races spread among us. But don't worry, we will give you jobs, jobs that turn out to be, well, as alienating as before. Like, even more, because the problem was never the machines, and it was never the immigrants, and it was never, you know, people of different different ethnicities or genders or, uh, or sexes. But as always, there is this relationship between machinery and a state of nature, you know, primordial, uh, a state of innocence from which we have suddenly fallen because of technology and therefore it is only poetic justice that this technology should be used against those who are responsible for the fall right and so Bookchin points to for example Rudolf Barrow the neo-nazi who uh, started the fascist ecology movement he's he's like you know the, the he's like you know the green party meets uh, QAnon like literally believing that salvation will come from a green hitler a Hitler that cares about Mother Nature and must purge it from the Jews and the uh, and you know and, and 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 the other filth. And so, isn't there some desire for self alienation in Heidegger's philosophy due to what we have done with technology? You know, like technology, the last god is the one that is going to doom us all, right? And didn't we bring this god? Didn't we uh, do it ourselves? Like Bookchin says, this mythos of a falling from authenticity has its roots in reactionary romanticism, most recently uh, in the philosophy of Martin Heidegger, whose uh, Volkish uh, spiritualism, latent in being in time, later emerged in his explicitly fascist works. And so needless to say that this lifestyle anarchism comes with a huge anti-democratic baggage. It has a disdain towards democracy, seeing common people as just sheep, incapable of seeing the true nature of reality, incapable of seeing how unique they are, how exceptional they are. And so we find another hypocrisy here within lifestyle anarchism, which is, you know, something like the French philosopher Jacques Rancière says in his book La Haine de la Démocratie, that, you know, those who criticize democracy are always the ones who are better benefiting the most from it. And so to be able to utter that sort of criticism, for example, against democracy and get away with it, it's a sign that you are living in a democratic state. And so in, uh, it is through struggle of many years, of many sacrifices, that you can get to put your individuality on such a pedestal. You know, like democracy allows lifestyle anarchists to be their own authentic self, yet they constantly shit on democracy, seeing it as just the rule of inauthentic uh, mobs, of people unex uh, un uh, incapable of ruling or governing themselves, uh, people who are incapable to be, you know, peaceful and authentic. And so ultimately, there is a divide between the authentic selves who rise above the herd and the inauthentic people the workers and the consumers who are not worth considering. And so as Bookchin uh, writes, it, uh, in its amoralism, the elitism easily lends itself to the unfreedom of the masses by ultimately placing them in the custody of the unique ones, a logic that may yield a leadership principle characteristic of fascist ideology. And so indeed, lifestyle anarchists, like the fascist leader, only cares about himself and not the people whose corpses he is willing to pile up to get his kingdom. And so the lifestyle anarchists are basically, they're basically Griffith from, uh, from Berserk. You know, they only use the communities to broaden their own individuality, not the freedom of others. And so this line of thought is alien to social anarchism and to anarchism in general. Elitism has nothing to do with, so, with anarchist, uh, within anarchist circles, whenever it is coming from the narcissists or the ones who endorse the elitism of their ruler. 
people who support the state, for example, may not see themselves as lifestyle anarchists and may throw around anti-individualist rhetoric, but in reality, they rely on the state so that their autonomy is not crushed. And so when the state oppresses many others, they will throw in the, they will throw in a, oh, that's terrible, but we need the state, we need the elite to oppress the freedom of the many so that their individuality is safe. So those who argue that the state is necessary always have to admit that they are committed to a view in which having a fascist, a fascist state will always be better than having no state at all. So to never question the validity of the state, always taking it for granted that the state is necessary, otherwise we fall back into barbarism, means that it is okay to sacrifice the lives of millions if that's the price to pay to have a state, if that's the price to pay for protecting one's autonomy. And so already in the 19th century, Kropotkin already argued that people holding on to the state because without it life would be a disaster is like people arguing that without God, people will kill each other. The necessity of a state comes from an irrational fear of violence and of barbary that make us believe that any form of violence within the state is somehow better than violence outside of the state. So not only this line of thought makes us like the primitives who sees outsider as probably robbers and murderers, it is now taken to its radical extremes because at least the primitives saw their tribes, uh, you know, saw their tribes as members, uh, their tribe members as kin. But with the state, there are no affiliation anymore. Everyone becomes a stranger, an outsider to everyone else. We're all in a constant state of flight or fight. And therefore, we are as gullible as the Indians with the ghost shirts. The state is the new shaman, it's the new priest, the god of today, that presents itself like the, like the big short, uh, like, the bi like the big ghost shirt, sorry, for everyone against everyone. And so, according to Kropotkin, we're not done with, uh, with superstition as long as we, uh, as we can't, because of our fears uh, of, of hell, think of other possible social and political organizations that do not involve a state. And so, another contradiction here within Stirner, you can't, on the one hand, atomize, uh, atomize communities to the degree that Stirner does, and think that you, you, don't, you wouldn't need a state. And so the Sternian, the Sternian idealism and egoism leads necessary to both elitism and the state, which ultimately leads to, uh, to hindering individuality, autonomy, and collective freedom. As Kropotkin says, uh, quoting, uh, quoting another guy, uh, Bosch's criticism of Sterner's individual anarchism as form of elitism, that the aim of all superior civilization is not to permit all member of the members of the community to develop in a natural way, in a normal way, but to permit certain better endowed individuals fully to develop, even at the cost of the happiness and the very existence of the mass of mankind. So Bookchin then puts us in front of a dilemma. Anarchy has often claimed to be order without power, but Bookchin doesn't throw away power. Rather, he says that power is necessary for making societies better. What we are in front of in anarchism is a choice between power, which always exists, will, will belong either to the collective in a face-to-face -face and clearly institutionalized democracy, or to the ego of a few oligarch, oligarchs who will produce a tyranny of structuralness. And so this is a tradition from which lifestyle anarchism has emerged. It is not for freedom, but for brutality and savagery. It is for apathy. It is for irrationality. It is fascist in its core, as is bourgeois society. And it is inherently anti-democratic and rejects all kinds of criticism, all aspects of free speech when it offends its ego and complains about censorship when it is applied to their own speech. So, as opposed to this swarm of uh, contradiction, of irrationality, of double binds, Bookchin concludes his book by giving a sketch of what a social anarchism is. 
it is heir to the enlightenment tradition with due regard to that tradition's limits and uh, incompleteness depending upon how it defines reason social anarchism celebrates the human the thinking human mind without in any way denying passion ecstasy imagination play and art yet rather than re uh, reify them into lay into hazy categories it tries to incorporate them into everyday life it is committed to rationality while opposing the rationalization of experience to technology while opposing the mega machine to social institutionalization while opposing class rule and hierarchy to genuine politics based on the confederal coordination of municipalities or communes by the people in direct face-to-face -face democracy while opposing parliamentarianism and the state. And so the confederation of municipalities of the communes means that you have a commune of the communes in which all communes federate each other. This view is called as communalism. It's called communalism. And it will be the political model that Bookshin is going to promote until the end of his life. The communalism is about freedom as opposed to autonomy. It seeks the freedom of all instead of, you know, the, ju uh, the, the, the jouissance of the few individuals who can afford it. It is based on practices and principles in which everyone cares for everyone, where everyone deliberates and has a say about political affairs, where everyone gets the support from others as well as constructive criticism, and, you know, basically, this, this reminds me of a quote from the philosopher Max Horkheimer. Individuality is impaired when each man decides to fend for himself. Which doesn't mean that in communalism you have representatives who decide for you, but that decisions are taken collectively and that everyone has right to access all resources available in order to deliberate about an issue. Therefore, by allowing individuals to have a plethora of resources produced by others and by themselves, the potential of the commune's freedom only increases. This, of course, means that decisions are taken by a majority rule, and like we said before, communities, uh, I mean, sorry, minorities have the right to challenge that decision through deliberation and argumentation. And so communalism, to quote again Bookchin, is describe, uh, it describes the democratic dimension of anarchism as a major, major, majoritarian administration of the public sphere. But it is necessary to note that majority decisions have priority and will be applied if the minorities are incapable of changing the majority's mind. But what Bookchin is uh, is sketching as a, as a society model isn't one where the minority cannot oppose the majority, but one in which the majority has the duty and the obligation to listen to the discourse of the minority. The last thing that Bookchin is arguing for is, uh, is a Matt Walsh or a Jordan Peterson who clearly don't listen to their opposition, just paint them as degenerates and the resentful uh, dictator wannabes. They carefully choose the settings and the format in which they, uh, they know the other side will have, uh, will have no time to you know, carefully elaborate, or they pick the ones that they know cannot argue for their case. And likewise, when they are in the minority, they can't divert conversations like you know, Peterson barely, barely did in his rant about how uh, the psychological association is demanding that he, is, you know, uh, that he, that he takes social media training or that they are uh, taking, uh, taking away his medical license because, as he puts it, is because I expressed political opinions against Trudeau and in fact it is because he called his colleagues butchers despite the evidence that he, uh, Peterson, is wrong about many things concerning the trans, uh, the transgender and the transitioning issue. So, to quote Bookchin, in the very uh, existential situation, uh, situation, if you please, of an anarchist society, a direct libertarian democracy, decisions would not uh, would most uh, would most certainly be made following open discussion. There, uh, thereafter, the outvoted minority, even a minority of one, would have every opportunity to present countervailing arguments to try to change that decision. 
and this is no call for decisions by consensus, since in consensus the minority will have no opportunity to challenge the prevailing views. Instead, it is about always letting the minority having the opportunity to argue back and argue against, and also, and more importantly, making sure that the minority have the means to do so. So, minorities won't have any problem in anarchistic societies to, ex to express their disagreement and no rational discourse will be dismissed or discarded or, as it often is, ignored by those, who, uh, by those with the bigger platforms, by the way, uh, which in turn become themselves a minority that is manipulating the consensus. <laughs> so, to quote uh, Bookchin, uh, functioning on the basis of consensus assures that uh, important decision-making will be either manipulated by a minority or collapses completely. The tyranny of the structuralness that consensus decision-making produced per permitted a well-organized few to control the unwidely deinstitutionalized and largely disorganized many within the movement. So. Uh, so the point is to maintain, as he says, dissensus, the all-important process of continual dialogue, disagreement, challenge and counter-challenge, where without which social as well as individual creativity would be impossible. So the problem is, is of course, that without the recognition of society's role in the creation of the free individual, uh, the anarchist's model, like for example, uh, Al Susan Brown's, is bound to fall into consensus, because consensus doesn't see the dialectical opposition and movements within issues. You know, consensus is a historical, whereas dissensus is basically how you get history, by dialectical oppos uh, opposing forces that Come, that come over each other through rational discourse. Hence, uh, hence uh, Bookchin claims to, uh, claims to have reached an equilibrium between majority rule and libertarian freedom. Democracy is not antithetical to anarchism, nor are majority rule and non-consensual decisions incomm incommensurable with a libertarian society. So Bookchin doesn't go into details about what a communalist society will look like in this book. He does it in other works, and which I will certainly explore in the, in the future. But it is also worth noting that Bookchin doesn't shy away from admitting that communalism has some flaws, and he doesn't assert that there cannot be other stateless models of, you know, peaceful coexistence. The human mind has an infinite potential when it comes to finding innovative ways to organize society, to democratize technology and education, to come up with great ideas, to make our lives easier and more fulfilling, to engineer an um, environment that reward and fosters uh, cooperation and care that manifest, you know, the, 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 that would manifest the, the, the angels, uh, the better angels of our nature. Um, it is therefore very regret regrettable that when, quote, in the United States and much of Europe, precisely at a time when mass disillusionment with the state has reached unprecedented, unprecedented proportions, anarchism is in retreat. So Bookchin seeks out to rehabilitate anarchism in the popular mind, uh, especially, uh, especially the working class that after the Spanish Revolution and due to lifestyle anarchism and you know the, the, the May, the May 68 the postmodernist uh, started to wane as a revolutionary subject. He wants to show that anarchism, uh, sh to show what anarchism really stands for. Quote, the most creative feature of traditional anarchism is its commitment to four basic tenets. A confederation of, uh, of a decentralized uh, multiplicity, uh, municipality, sorry, a confederation of decentralized municipality, uh, an, un an unwavering opposition to statism, a belief in direct democracy, and a vision of a libert uh, libertarian communist society. So this is what anarchism has to offer to the people who've, uh, who've grown more and more dissatisfied with their government and are dis, uh, displaying, quote, a more compelling sentiment for a few, uh, for a new uh, pol politics, even a new social dispensation. Anarchism can give to people a sense of direction that allows for uh, security and ethical meaning. 
It is therefore important that anarchism repudiates uh, lifestyle anarchism and holds on to the traditional values of the left uh, that we mentioned in the first video, uh, holding on to universalism and to uh, internationalism, to transcend nationalistic rhetoric, to resist anti-civilization and anti-technological discourse, to fight off uh, superstition and irrationality with reason and noble uh, emotions, hold on to political ideal and social commitment, and usher societies of freedom and intellectual fulfillment without oppression, without racism, without sexism, without transphobia, homophobia, and all kinds of, uh, all kinds of oppression, uh, as long as it is uh, reasonable and doable. So, to conclude, uh, to malign civilization without due recognition of its enormous uh, potentialities for self-conscious freedom, a freedom conferred by reason as well as emotion, by insight as well as desire, by prose as well as poetry, is to retreat back into the shadowy world of brutishness when thought was dim, was dim and intellectualization and intellectuation was only an evolutionary promise. And so that's uh, that's it for for this book. I hope that you enjoyed this uh, these uh, these reviews and that you are going to get interested in anarchism and i will see you next time for a for starting a new review on a new book uh, and